Uh, well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are joining us from. I'd like to welcome you today to our Data Plus Diversity event, which is a series that provides a platform for community conversations surrounding the challenges and solutions to data, to diversity in data. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Shansi Lee Jagannath. I'm the Vice President of Data Visualization and Training at Lovelytics based in Arlington, Virginia. I'm also the founder and CEO of the nonprofit organization, Millennials in Data, where I work to bridge the data literacy and analytical skills gap by training, mentoring, and preparing millennials to enter a data-driven global environment. I am also a four-year Tableau visionary and member of the Tableau Equity Task Force, and I'm excited to be your host today. If you have to drop early, this session is being recorded and we will share it with everyone after today's event. If you have any questions for our presenters today, please be sure to submit them using the Q&A function so that we can share them as they come through. And please do continue to use the chat feature to engage and get to know each other. Go ahead and continue to let us know where you're joining us from today. Today's meeting is focused on mental well-being and how we can create inclusive, safe and supportive communities for discussing experiences, knowledge and resources for those who have had or currently face mental health challenges and their allies. During today's event, we'll be defining exactly what mental health and mental illness is and how they differ from each other. So first up on the agenda is an interview with a new member of the Community Equity Task Force, Shola Alojo. At our Data Plus Diversity events, we wanna highlight a member of the Community Equity Task Force and hear from them firsthand what they're up to and just get to know them better. Then Dr. Amy Barnhorst will be joining us from University of California, Davis Health to share her expertise on the differences between mental illness and mental health and how the pandemic has played a part. She'll also share some interventions with us to better improve one's mental well-being. We'll be leaving some time for some questions and answers with Dr. Barnhorst at the end of her presentation. So be sure to submit any questions you have for her using the Q&A button. Lastly, we have Shazira Ahmad Zawawi, sorry Shazira, um, here with us to share the journey behind making her biz titled My State of Mind, a four day visual journey and how we can create a better environment for sharing and discussing data visualizations and mental health. A big thank you to all of our presenters for taking time to join us today. All righty, let's go ahead and get right into it. So first up, I'm really excited to be joined by Shola Alojo, who is an insights manager at Samsung's Electronics UK. His Tableau journey started back in October 2020, and he is a current member of Tableau's Community Equity Task Force. He values the embrace of culture of the data fam community and the tremendous support system Tableau offers to new users. Outside of data, Shola competed at the 2012 UK Championships and Olympic Trials and the Triple Jump. Speaking of jump, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So first awesome. up, Shola, welcome. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Chantilly. Um, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, I believe this is our first conversation, you know, but I've been following your journey uh, for quite some time and, you know, some of the great work you've been able to do with uh, millennials and data, you know, so it's a real privilege uh, to be here speaking with you. No, I appreciate that. It's a privilege as well to be speaking <laughs> with you. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. What has your journey been like with the Tableau community? Oh, awesome. Um, well, let me start by giving you a bit of background um, about who I am. Um, so as Chantilly said, uh, my name is Sholo Alojo. Um, I'm Nigerian. Uh, my family and I moved to the UK uh, when I was seven. So um, here's where I spent uh, the vast majority of my formative years. Um, I currently work as an insights manager uh, for Samsung, um, in particular the DA field team. You know, it sounds way cooler than, you know, what it is, you know. Uh, basically, I capture promoter sales on digital appliances, you know. You know, I try to then make sense of that data, you know, identify any opportunities and trend before I communicate that insights back over to Samsung for them to sort of uh, make their business decisions, you know. So that's how I sort of pay the bills. Um, as far as uh, the Tableau uh, community goes, um, I'm a featured author, you know, as of last year. Um, I'm also a Tableau public ambassador and sort of a new member of the um, 
equity task force uh, uh, that was announced earlier this year. Um, so in terms of my journey, I've been working in a data space um, for about five years, um, but only really dialed into um, the Tableau community and you know, data fam um, about two years ago. So in, in 2020, you know, right in the heart of the you know, pandemic, you know, I knew I wanted to you know, upskill in the field of uh, analytics. Uh, and I actually um, set out to you know, pursue a master's in that at Florida State, but you know, uh, COVID had other plans, you know. <laughs> And so I found myself back um, back in the UK, and you know, as I was applying for roles, I you know came, I, I met Eve Thomas and the Information Lab, and she guided me to the you know Data Fam community, you know, on Twitter, and it sort of you know took off from there. Uh, um, the community has you know been able to offer such an expansive you know open source library. Um, so for a period of about you know six months, I you know immersed myself and you know drew inspiration from like truly, truly incredible authors. Um, you know, I read blogs, you know, uh, took part in a weekly, you know, data sets, you know, attended webinars um, and connected with some, you know, amazing individuals. And, you know, as time went on, you know, my efforts sort of compounded. And not only did I level up my Tableau skills, you know, I had managed to, you know, create, you know, a, a body of work in a portfolio that's, you know, you know, taken me to rooms that, you know, I would not have been able to, you know, manifest otherwise, you know. so. So to say the Tableau community has been, you know, transformative for my life, you know, it would be an understatement. You know, I'm truly, truly humbled by the sort of wave of support and encouragement the community has been able to sort of pour into me in this past two years. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I totally agree. I always say that out of all of the, the BI tools that I've used, Tableau definitely has like the best community and the best support system. That's amazing. Awesome. All righty. So I've spent some time on your blog, but can you share a little bit more with the audience about how you've been able to combine data and social justice through your medium blogs? What have you learned through that experience? Yes. Well, it's actually been a while since I uh, last blog, you know, um, I would often use medium as a platform just to, you know, pull out my, my thoughts, you know, not only rooted in data, but um, just express my stance on, you know, larger societal discourse. And um, I think it was off the back of my first visitor day selection, um, Jessica Lyon from the, oh, let, let me make sure I'm saying this right. So she's a academic program manager at Tableau. Um, so she reached out to me on LinkedIn, um, dropped me a message and asked if I'll be uh, interested in, you know, just writing a piece about, you know, uh, data, um, higher education and, and social justice, you know, and you know, it's topics I'm, you know, passionate about. So I was like, you know, <laughs> dope, where, where do I sign? Um, um, but just to, you know, quickly summarize, um, the blog simply touched on uh, the recent adoption of a data-driven approach and how that can be leveraged to actually drive change in social justice. You know, you know nowadays we have information surrounding uh, disparities in, you know, you know, race, you know, gender, um, sexual orientation, you know, social economic, you know, status, you know, um, not only is that um, data available, but it's, you know, quantifiable now. And we can, you know, take that a step further, you know, um, we have tools like, you know, Tableau, where we can take, you know, what was seemingly an arbitrary, you know, data set and create these, you know, these beautiful, like infographics, you know, you know, storylines and interactive dashboards, you know, that now adds some context and, you know, substance behind, you know, the efforts of these change groups, you know, whose work may have, you know, previously, you know, been hidden in the shadows, you know, so I, I, I literally just spoke about that in that, in that blog and um, also how academia can support these efforts, you know, you know, what can students do, you know, what can instructors do so we can, you know, start to um, have those conversations. Um, what I learned um so i think just just reflecting on what i learned in the process um i think a few words jump out like patience you know patience is a <laughs> is a word that jumps out to me um i think uh, reform certainly takes time um you know especially when pushing for change it can be easy to get into the habit of trying to do too much too quickly you know um and that's a surefire way to you know you know feel overwhelmed and you know, it leads to breakdown in communication and ultimately, you know, plans fall through. So, um, but again, I, you know, tapped in with, you know, community leaders and, you know, 
some mentors like a, a Morse and Soa, um, and just honestly learned the value of you know, just being present in a moment. And you know, a mantra now I hold today is you know nothing in nature uh, blooms all year round. You know, so you know when trying to solve system uh, systemic um, problems, um, you know, I've uh, I now have a sort of better understanding of you know. Uh, when to assert myself and when to inevitably, you know, sort of take a back seat. So that's what I sort of learned as I was, you know, um, going through that um, process of building that blog. That's that's really awesome to hear. And I actually had the pleasure of meeting Jessica uh, a couple of weeks ago. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. she she she's she's really great. Uh, her her experience is 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 crazy. It's crazy good. So um, I appreciate you met you mentioning her and, and her yeah, being involved in the blog post too. So this is your first year on the, the task force. Is there anything that you hope to accomplish in the coming year? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, aside from being connected with, you know, uh, highly talented, um, like-minded individuals, you know, something I'm really excited uh, about with Equity Task Force is, you know, just being a, given a platform to really champion diversity in this space, you know, um, it's a new realm for me. You know, I've attended diversity and inclusion uh, talks before in the past, but I've never really been in the, in a driving seat, you know, so um, that's pretty exciting. Um, uh, this year, it's, you know, it's a pretty strong team as well. You know, there have been, you know, some recent changes, you know, new members added. Um, and in the background, you know, we're reassessing our uh, mission statement just to make sure the efforts we are, you know, pouring in still align with our uh, vision for what we feel a diverse and inclusive, you know, community looks like, you know. Um, and what else, you know, I've started, you know, uh, concentrating efforts on a micro level as well. Um, so I've been working with Sarah Bartlett, who's a uh, Tableau visionary and uh, the co-leader of the London Tug. Um, and we're just trying to explore ways of how we can take Tableau to inner city schools in the in marginalised area. Um, so in South London, for example, we have places like, you know, Streatham and Croydon, you know, where we have whole heaps of, you know, students from, you know, diverse backgrounds. Uh, but they've received very, very limited exposure to data and tools like, you know, Tableau. So we're really trying to uh, bridge that data literacy gap and, and get in at the grassroots, uh, grassroots level um, with the hopes that that would eventually sort of cascade out. Um, uh, another one, Alan Hillary, um, a few weeks ago, you know, who is, uh, he's been a member of the Equity Task Force since, you know, day dot, you know, so he, he plugged me in with, you um, the founders of an organization called Kids in Data, uh, who run uh, a data literacy workshop that, you know, uh, helps young children uh, learn about, you know, data and visualization through games, you know, how amazing is that? Um, so we're really looking to just like um, partner um, with these, you know, diversity and inclusion uh, specialists and, and build out a network of champions, you know, it's a it's going to be a collaborative effort, you know, I'm excited um, and I'm certainly going to lean on the experience of, you know, these individuals and um, help sort of determine how we can, you know, make uh, an impact, you know, a lasting impact rather, you know, authentic impact, yeah. I absolutely agree. And it's great to hear about the work that you're doing around data literacy. That's definitely a passion of mine and uh, why I started Millennials in Data too. So it's really great that you're connecting with the right individuals on this task force and this task force is really enabling you to continue to do that work. Awesome. Is there anything that comes to mind on how we as a Tableau community can create a more safe and inclusive space for all to participate? Oh man, this is a fantastic question. Um, I think we have to start by like sort of uh, holding a mirror up to it, you know, and, you know, start thinking of how, how not to go about creating an inclusive space, you know. Um, I think you certainly don't want to approach it from a vantage point of, you know, confrontation, right? Um, in the past, I've seen, you know, many groups, you know, take this approach and it's, it just turns out to be like a, a, a bit of a yelling match, really, um, and it creates nothing but further divides. So I think uh, the first step would be to sort of figure out how we're, you know, go about having these uh, conversations uh, properly, um, that's uh, important. I um, also think putting leaders from diverse backgrounds in driving seat is a step in the right direction as well. You know, um, for example, I'm in a data leadership position at, uh, at work for my company um, that is a high visibility name like Samsung, you know, and I'm constantly thinking, you know, how can I get children to identify with me, you know? So it's almost, it's been that inspiration, you know, through representation 
Um, funny enough, this was actually a topic that you know came up at our, at our last um, equity task force uh, meeting. Um, we'd noticed that there was a lack of you know tableau visionaries that hail from a diverse background. I think other than yourself, you know, I can't you know think of uh, too many more. So. And, and, and it's interesting because we have some phenomenal leaders in the Tableau community. You know, you only need to think about the likes of, you know, Chimdi Wusu, uh, Irene Diomi, you know, uh, Zayn Abayo Demeji, you know, you know, these are like incredible, they've like produced incredible portfolios and, and, and great bodies of work. But yeah, for some reason, they've, you know, yet to take that leap into visionary status. So um, we're trying to identify, you know, those barriers of entries, you know, um, is it rooted in, you know, public speaking? Um, is there a, uh, a more technical, is there more technical training, you know, needed? You know, what is it, you know, how can we start to, you know, put the protocols in place to help, you know, these individuals make that jump? Um, so not only are we, you know, showing them the door, but we're equipping them, you know, with the dexterity to be able to know what to do when they're in the room. Um, yeah, and, and I think um, in building an inclusive, you know, culture, another, another way as it pertains more closely to data is to, you know, just choose topics and data sets that resonate with these target audience, you know. Um, you know, my younger brother, for example, you know, he's, a, he's an aspiring rapper, you know. <laughs> um, he also does product design, but he, he's an artist, you know, and when I'm trying to explain, you know, what it is I do with Tableau, you know, I doubt I'd be interested in learning about, I don't know, like, you know, coal mine production costs, you know. Um, but if I were to create like a visualization, you know, about Central C, you know, AJ Tracy, Heady One, you know, these grime artists that, you know, um, he looks up to, you know, actually paint their story, you know, what a journey's been like, you know, how many albums they sold, you know, like, you know, that hits home, right? You know, um, it makes them, you know, makes them feel comfortable and, you know, create the sense of, you know, belonging, you know, and I think, you know, once we've piqued their initial curiosity, then we can start injecting some topics that's more uh, grounded and has, you know, wider social implications. So, yeah, so I think it's twofold, you know, you know, um, having diverse leaders who, you know, understand uh, the mindset of these um, communities, you know, we're trying to, you know, get into and, you know, and then just creating that sense of belonging, you know, and marrying those two, you know, elements on, on, on nuanced ground. So you can then start to paint a path of a more diverse, no, so, excuse me, a more diverse and inclusive, you know, community. Absolutely. And we could talk for hours and hours on <laughs> this, particular, this particular topic, but I, I know yeah. we're running up on time. So I have one more question for you. So there's a lot of folks tuned in today. What topic should they reach out to you about? Oh, wow. Um, well, if you're uh, new to the Tableau space, um, you know, I know you saw this event, you know, posted on Twitter or, or, or LinkedIn and you, you just want to get involved, you know, certainly reach out to me. You know, I'll do my best to, you know, point you in the right direction and, you know, plug you in with resources to kind of help you get started. Um, it's such a, you know, broad field uh, data, you know, not only Tableau, like data in general. And it's, you know, it's very easy to feel like you're sort of stumbling along in the dark. You know, I, I certainly felt that way when I first started, but, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to meet um, individuals um, who sort of steered me along. So uh, that's one. Um, if you're in uh, the academia space, you know, just reach out, <laughs> just reach out anything, you know, uh, to do with, you know, data in school, I would love to get involved. Um, so just tap in there. Um, I'm not really active on social media, but, you know, I'll, I'll drop my, you know, Twitter and LinkedIn handles. Uh, I'm actually planning to start like a, a, a Calendly, um, you know, feed. Um, so when we can, you know, get like, you know, these 30 minute time slots for, you know, brain dates and, you know, just general story swapping. So, um, yeah, just in, in, in closing, you know, uh, Sadal, uh, Sadal McCall, like, I hope I'm saying his, right, his name right. Um, so he was a former equity task force member, uh, task force member in, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a in an earlier uh, data and diversity series. He, you know, described the task force as, you know, being harbingers and messengers, you know, um, whilst we do our best to fight you know, for more inclusive space, you know, you know, we're inevitably going to like, you know, fall short in certain areas and there are going to be some gaps. So if you feel like there's any uh, topics we've not fully captured and, you know, you, you want to like to see us explore more of, you know, just, you know, let us know, you know, uh, often liken it to these um, ideas of cups, you know, so as we're simultaneously 
um, pouring into our mission, you know, you guys are pouring into us, you know, so please, please do, you know, get in touch with us in that regard. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today. No, that, that, that was really great. Thank you so much for, awesome. for joining Thank us you. today. It was, it was a pleasure having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, yeah, it's just, just a wonderful, I'm, I'm just uh, honored and uh, humbled, truly. Awesome. Well, thank All you. Right. Thank you. All righty. Next up, we have Dr. Amy Barnhorse. Dr. Amy Barnhorse is the vice chair of community mental health at the UC Davis Department of Psychiatry, an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine and the director of the Bullet Points Project, a state funded effort to develop a firearm violence prevention curriculum for healthcare providers. In her clinical work, she treats patients with serious mental illness in the emergency department, the county jail, a crisis unit, and a 50-bed inpatient psychiatric hospital. She's a nationally recognized expert on firearms law and mental illness, and her academic work focuses on the interface between firearms, violence, suicide, and the mental health system. She has testified before the California and Alaska Senates on these issues and writes about them for the New York Times, Slate, and her blog at Psychology Today. Thank you so much for taking some time to join us today, Amy. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much, Chantilly. Um, and thanks everyone for having me. I'm gonna put my slides up real quick. Okay, great. So um, today I'm gonna to be talking about COVID and mental health and mental illness and the effects that the pandemic has had on that. And as Chantilly said in my bio, I'm, um, I, I work in a little bit of a different world than you all. And it's, it's fascinating to hear what you all do with data and data visualization and how everyone um, is from all over the world, really. It's, uh, it's really inspiring. And I work in a you know, small niche of academic medicine. So I teach and do some research in um, psychiatry. I also have an appointment in the Department of Emergency Medicine because I work on a firearm injury prevention project that's funded by the state of California. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about research that has um, shown us what impacts the pandemic had both on mental health and on mental illness and some of the things that we can do to improve both mental health and mental illness. Um, if you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter. My handle is below. I tweet about these topics, firearms, suicide, mental illness, sometimes about my kids, my bikes, um, the mountains, things like that. So um, I don't have any financial disclosures to report. And today, again, we'll talk about the difference between poor mental health and mental illness. Oftentimes people say we're having a mental health pandemic. Well, wouldn't that be great, right? If we just all we're having mental health. And they conflate these two words, mental health and mental illness. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the difference is between having poor mental health or a mental health problem, having good mental health and having mental illness. And then we'll talk about how these changed with COVID and some of the solutions to these problems. Okay, so mental health. This is a good thing. This is what we all strive for. And when you have good mental health, you sleep well, you have good energy during the day, you can concentrate and focus on your work. You're productive. You're in, motivated to exercise, eat a healthy diet and have moderate alcohol intake. You're not driven to unhealthy eating practices, sedentary lifestyle, overindulging. And you're able to maintain good social connectedness, whatever that is for you. So some people, you know, that's seeing a friend once a week. Some people that's being around folks every day, but maintaining healthy social connections and feeling like you get happiness and enjoyment out of your life. Maybe not every single moment of your life because we all have to get through the drudgery, but that you're able to appreciate things and feel joy. And this is the mental health that people want, that people aspire to. Mental illness, on the other hand, when we talk about that, what we mean is a particular set of symptoms that cluster together to a diagnosis. And so as a psychiatrist, I have tools to treat mental illness that include things like therapy, that include things like medications. But those medications aren't just for feelings or um, a, a very you know, specific reaction to a stressor. They're for a cluster of symptoms that merits a particular diagnosis. And so these diagnoses include things like major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder. 
There are others also. And there's a discussion to be had about the merits of putting labels on people and putting them in boxes like this. But the bottom line is that from my perspective as a medical provider, I need to have um, some faith that the treatment that I'm offering this person is tried and tested for an illness like they have. I don't just want to throw a bunch of medications at somebody and like hope for the best. So I want to know that if, I, if I'm going to try an antipsychotic medication, that it has been tested and evaluated in people with schizophrenia, like I think my patient might have, because they meet those same specific descriptors and that same specific symptom cluster. There is a spectrum, right, between mental health and mental illness. And somewhere in the middle is mental health problems. And this is a really vague sort of wastebasket term, but it encompasses essentially the converse of the things we talked about on the mental health section. So mental health problems include things like insomnia, constant fatigue, an inability to concentrate, feelings of low self-worth, um, poor diet, low physical activity, increased alcohol intake. I mean, obviously there can be other reasons for these things too, but many times when people are experiencing poor mental health, these things start to slide as well. And then social isolation and disconnectedness. These are the kinds of symptoms that if they get too far, they can contribute to a mental illness or even cluster together to merit a diagnosis of something like major depressive disorder if it's severe enough. But these can also just be symptoms of going through a hard time, having increased stressors, um, and again, sort of worsening mental health, but not necessarily a specific mental illness. Also irritability, anxiety, and sadness. These are, um, these are really common emotions. They're natural reactions to certain stressors in our lives. They themselves are not necessarily a mental illness, but to a, certain, to a certain degree, if they get so severe that they're impairing somebody's ability to function and they're coupled with other symptoms, other mental health problems, they may merit a diagnosis of a mental illness like we talked about earlier. I'm gonna show some um, fact sheets and some data. These are all from other sources. So I'll tell folks where these sources are from and it's written on the graphs as well. And this will give you a sense of how we visualize data in mental health and in academic medicine. These are fact sheets from NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It's a resource for families and patients um, who suffer from mental illness. And they do a lot of great education and infographics that explain the impacts of mental illness and mental health problems. So this fact sheet is talking about 2020, which I'm sure you all remember was a very hard year, a lot, a lot of changes um, with the pandemic and the shutdowns and school closures and a lot of uncertainty. So this is uh, data that's based on CDC and other survey data, but put together in this fact sheet by NAMI. And, the data shows that one in five people reported that the pandemic had a significant negative impact on their mental health. So we're talking about that first slide of things like good sleep, good social connectedness, good feelings of self-confidence, productivity, and focus. The pandemic had a negative impact on that. I'm actually surprised it's only one in five that report that, but that is what the survey data says. So it's about 20%. However, if you look at folks who have mental illness, and serious mental illness, which is a subset of mental illnesses, almost half of those people said that there was a significant negative impact on their mental health. So it may seem counterintuitive, but people who have a, a mental illness, even a serious mental illness, can also have good mental health at times when their mental illness is well controlled. So they can live happy, productive lives if they are fortunate enough to get good treatment. But they're more vulnerable to mental health problems than people without mental illness. And that's why more than twice the number or the proportion of those folks suffered mental health problems from the pandemic because they live in a more precarious state and they're going to be more susceptible and more vulnerable to the impacts that the pandemic had. Just to clarify real quick, I'll talk a little bit about mental illness versus serious mental illness. Um, you can think of mental illness as you know, if you want to be really broad, anything with a diagnostic category in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, serious mental illnesses tend to be, like they sound, much more serious. So mental illness that might cause somebody to, you know, miss days, if not weeks of work at a time, be psychiatrically hospitalized, be arrested or incarcerated for something related to their mental illness. So that's a, um, 
usually encompasses specific diagnoses like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder. Um, we also saw that one in five adults during the pandemic year 2020 experienced a mental illness and one in 20 experienced a serious mental illness. So interestingly, these are the same rates of mental illness and serious mental illness experienced in almost any other year. So while the pandemic had an effect on people's mental health, a negative impact for the most part, and it had a more of a negative impact for people who already struggled with mental illness, it did not create higher rates of mental illness itself. When we look at young adults, and young adults were a particularly vulnerable category of people during the pandemic, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. They did report at about the same rates as adults, so 20%, one in five, reported that the pandemic had a significant negative impact on their mental health. But again, we see that that was more than doubled for people who already had a mental health concern. So again, if you were already vulnerable, if you already struggled with poor mental health or mental illness, the pandemic was likely to have a disproportionate impact on that group than it did on everybody else. And this was borne out, you know, both in statistics and in my personal experience, that for young adults and adolescents, there was a big bump in mental health related emergency department visits for things like anxiety, depression, suicidal crises. Um, I saw this a lot. Normally, I only see adults in the emergency department. And there were days where I saw, you know, four or five, six kids coming in for various concerns. It's important to also note that there were some kids who did much better during the pandemic, and it was really a mixed bag. Um, school closures were forecast to be a huge disaster, and they were for some, but it's long been known that the highest rates of mental health-related emergency visits actually happened during the summer. I mean, I'm sorry, they actually happened during the school year. So during the summer and holidays, there's a little bit of a respite. School can be a big stressor for kids also. So you know, there was a lot going on, on that may have tipped the scales both directions. This is from a um, Journal of the American Medical Association study that looked at rates of depressive symptoms. So not necessarily major depressive disorder, not a specific mental illness, more like a mental health problem before and after COVID. And they looked at uh, two different surveys, but you can see that the dark line represents what people's responses were about depressive symptoms before COVID and the light line is after COVID. So on the left of this graph, you see that the majority of people, almost 80% pre-COVID said, yeah, I don't really have, um, or I don't really have depressive symptoms. They answered none. With COVID that went down to less than half. And then you can see as you go over that the bars in the gray start climbing. So more people had mild, more people had moderate, more people had moderately severe and severe depressive symptoms went from almost nobody having them pre-pandemic to almost 10% of people having them post-pandemic. This was a similar survey published in the same paper and same journal about psychological distress. And so this was a this is a very generalized quick and dirty screening tool that asks about a lot of the things I listed, your sleep, your feelings of restlessness, your ability to concentrate, your general satisfaction. And what it found was that people's levels of psychological distress really increased during the pandemic. Again, um, it, the light, I think it's actually reversed from the last graph. The light bar is pre-pandemic, the dark bar is post-pandemic. And you can see that almost that, that a huge number of adults, I mean, more than double reported that they had psychological distress after the pandemic as opposed to before. And there was a difference in the rates of increase of psychological distress by race. So we can see here that Hispanic people had a much bigger bump in psychological distress than black people or white people, which is interesting because by race, they started out about equal pre-pandemic, but for whatever reason, there was a big bump for the Hispanic population. We'll also look at age groups here where the other arrow is, um, because it's interesting that younger populations also experience a larger bump. If you look at the light gray bars, the responses about psychological distress were about the same, about the same number of people reported psychological distress pre-pandemic in every age breakdown. But post-pandemic, the young people had a much bigger jump, middle-aged people kind of a middle range jump 
and a smaller jump in folks over 55. And this was borne out in other research as well, that for whatever reason, older people tended to fare much better than younger people who struggled a lot. And possibly not surprising, pre and post pandemic, there is a correlation between household income and psychological distress. So in the gray bars, you can see that people at the higher end over $75,000 of income a year had less psychological distress than those at the lower end of income, less than $35,000. And again, those at the lower end not only ended up with higher levels of psychological distress later, or more people reported it, but that was a bigger jump for them. So a summary from these studies is that the rates of psychological distress were highest for young adults, Hispanic respondents, women, and those with more economic stress. We will see this play out again and again in various research about the pandemic, that people who were already vulnerable and didn't have a lot of reserve of whatever type of reserve that is, were the ones who got hit the hardest. So young adults who may not have the social, the employment, the financial reserves. Um, people of color, including Hispanic respondents, but in other studies, we'll see this also with black respondents, that they were hit harder oftentimes with less financial reserves, less social support, already feeling disenfranchised by public support systems and the government and the police. Women who are often in caregiving roles that had a lot of burden put on them, both at work and at home, and people who have less economic reserves. This is a different study that surveyed people about uh, mental health, substance abuse, and suicidal ideation. This was during June of 2020, so deep in the summer when everything was closed down. And almost half of the people reported that they had at least one adverse mental health condition because of the pandemic. And when you broke that down, it was about a quarter of folks said depression, a quarter said anxiety, and a quarter said trauma or stress-related disorders. Almost 15% said that they started or increased substance use during the pandemic, and nearly 10% of folks said that they seriously considered suicide. And when you look at younger people, nearly a quarter of young people during the pandemic said they seriously considered suicide. Well, it's hard to know how much of this is a change, right? And we didn't have good data because of course we didn't see the pandemic coming or hopefully we would have done things differently. We didn't have survey data to match this exactly pre-2020. But from other surveys, we were able to pull information and compare some things. So this is from 2019 survey data in the blue. Look at the rates of people reporting that they had depression in the blue 2019 compared to the purple. It went up almost by five times. Anxiety nearly tripled. And the people who seriously considered suicide pre-pandemic, that number more than doubled when we look at people in 2020. So there has been a big shift in the indicators of mental illness and mental health. And again, this risk was highest for young adults unpaid caregivers, which are often women and people of color, Hispanic and black respondents, those with less than a high school diploma, which correlates often with financial reserves, consistent employment and savings. And those with pre-existing mental health conditions, again, people who are already vulnerable, who were experiencing all these other stressors. Um, because of all of this, there were horrible media predictions about what was going to happen. And one of the things that I study is uh, suicide rates and what contributes to those. The media predicted that there would be an absolute tsunami of suicide, that we would lose more people to suicide than we were losing to the coronavirus itself. People were leveraging this to say, we need to reopen the schools right now. We're killing children by keeping them out of school. And I was really concerned myself. And I wrote some things early on in the pandemic, warning of this. What's really interesting though, is that this was not borne out at all. So the suicide rate in the United States has been increasing over time really consistently, actually since 1999. It's been on the upswing all the way up until 2018, which is the peak. This is a graph from CDC Whiskers data where they do nice data visualizations for you. They chose the very gendered colors, not me. Um, but you can see that in 2018, both for males and females, although males have a much higher rate of death by suicide, so they're you know, quite separated from females on the graph and their peak is higher. After 2018, it dropped to 2019 and then to everyone's surprise, it continued to drop in 2020. Suicide rates for the second year in a row were significantly lower during the pandemic and this trend has continued. We did not see the spike that everybody was, was predicting. 
What we did see that nobody predicted that I know of was that homicide rates really took off. So again, you can see that homicide rates are much higher for males than they are for females. And this is death by homicide. You can see that they kind of fluctuate over time with a variety of factors. In fact, the peak on the left side of the graph is due largely to the terrorist attacks of 2001. And then it goes down and kind of stays around that level for a while up until 2019. In 2020, the homicide rates went way up. We saw um, a 30% increase in homicide. It was the biggest single year jump that we've seen since 1905, but possibly since we have records of homicides. It's not really clear why this was happening since for a lot of 2020, people were not out and about on the streets, but it may have had to do with um, that people were not out and about on the streets and the people who were out and about were able to engage in more crime and more violent activity because there was less going on, less people around them. Um, there was a very fraught summer with police encounters and people may have not been working with law enforcement or being afraid of law enforcement. And we did see this in 2020 that due to the coronavirus pandemic, due to the social unrest, due to multiple incidents of police violence against Black people, due to multiple protests going on around the country, there was a huge run on gun sales. And this probably contributed largely to the increase in homicide across the nation. In California, from survey data, we know that over 100,000 Californian adults bought guns during a very brief window, about three months of 2020, and about half of these people were first-time buyers. So that's 50,000 brand new gun owners out there who were buying a gun during a pandemic when there are no safety training courses, when ranges aren't open, when shooting clubs aren't um, getting together to meet. And nationwide, there were about 4.3 million more guns purchased in a three month window than what was expected from previous years during that time. So this is an 85% increase, lots more firearms in circulation, which both reflects and causes mental health problems. So a lot of the people surveyed about their new firearm purchase said, I'm scared about my neighbors. I'm scared of the police. I'm scared of the protesters. There was a lot of fear and unrest and uncertainty and people were buying extra toilet paper and extra firearms during that time. Firearms also contribute to violence and poor mental health because people who are in communities that experience a lot of violence often have trauma and long-term sequelae, both physical, psychological, and social from the experience of being around violence. And they also are a big risk factor for suicide. So what do we do about all this? Well, we did actually learn some things during the pandemic or we relearned some things we already knew. And there are different approaches for mental illness than for shoring up mental health. And some of these approaches are individual. Some of them are societal. For people who have mental illness, so again, depressive, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder. Therapy is a mainstay of treatment for almost all of these disorders. Therapy is really hard to come by and it's very expensive. If you can find a therapist that has available appointments and is covered by your insurance, you were like a unicorn. Most people end up struggling to even find somebody taking insurance, whether or not that person is good and well-trained and has a therapy that will match their um, needs is a whole nother story. And then it's very expensive and time consuming. So oftentimes it's easier and um, the default becomes treating folks with medications, which is a big part of what I do as a psychiatrist prescribe antidepressants, antipsychotics, a variety of treatments. But it's also really important for people with everything from anxiety disorders to schizophrenia to have healthy social supports. So family that looks out for them, friends, community, jobs they can go to and feel that they're a contributing part of society, safe, affordable housing where they're not worried about their belongings or their medications or their own safety. And also minimizing the use of drugs and alcohol. An enormous um, percentage of the folks that I work with in um, the places where I see patients have problems with drugs and alcohol, and it contributes both to their medications not working and to their mental illness getting worse on its own. It also can contribute to them spiraling out of their housing and ending up homeless and on the streets. And all of these things together will conspire to make any mental health or mental illness worse. In terms of the best approach for shoring up mental health, medications may not have as much of a role here. 
unless you're treating really specific things like insomnia or panic attacks. But in general, lifestyle interventions are going to be better for mental health. Again, these are intensive and they take time. Things like therapy, getting enough exercise, you know, all the research shows that exercise is essentially a magic bullet for depression, anxiety, and all these things. But the problem is it's hard to motivate to do it when your depression's out of control, getting good sleep at night, eating well and staying healthy, maintaining healthy social support. So, you know, reaching out to family, reaching out to friends, being part of a community. And again, minimizing the use of drugs and alcohol, which are easy to lean on in times of distress and self-medicate, particularly to get rid of negative emotions in the short term, but they can contribute to long-term problems. In terms of the public health approach, what can we do as a society to both increase people's mental well-being and health, but also help people who have mental illness? One of the biggest things we can do is increase our access to care. So it's nearly impossible to find a therapist, but also try to find a psychiatrist or an inpatient psychiatric bed when you need one in crisis or somebody who can treat you right then and there when you're feeling suicidal. It's very difficult for people to get access to care. And one thing that the pandemic did do was open up a lot of telemedicine appointments so folks have that better access. Affordable, safe housing, it's almost impossible to get better and feel well if you do not have a safe place to lay your head at night. So making sure that folks have access to affordable, safe housing is going to be crucial for everyone's mental health, as well as providing people with good educational and employment opportunities. We know that poverty is definitely a contributor to poor mental health and can make mental illness worse. But being a part of something, whether it's a school or a workplace or a community, like Shrola talked about with Tableau, can really be good for everybody's mental health. Um, and again, having basic income, being able to afford to take care of not just your basic needs, but your medications as well. Another really important thing, and I see this a lot with my patients, is that they have a lot of involvement with the criminal justice system. Poor mental health, as well as mental illness, and the overlapping substance use problems that can develop often lead to incarceration in the jail and prison system, which is good for nobody's mental health. And so really thinking about reforming our criminal justice system to reduce how what types of offenses we're prosecuting and who we're locking up for long periods of time. And then reducing access to lethal means. Um, again, I do firearms work, and this is one of the most proven ways to reduce the suicide rate is to make sure that people don't have access to firearms. Um, these things all together are called the social determinants of health. Those are the non-medical, non-individual, um, more public health approach, things that we can do that we can improve for people's mental well-being and to help with mental illness. And this is an article, if anyone's interested, that I wrote about these social determinants of health for sleep, how during the pandemic we, we started finally stepping up and meeting some basic needs and that it would be great if we could do that more. Um, just some crisis numbers so people have them. A reminder that the National Suicide Lifeline just changed their number from the 273 talk to 988. So you can now, rather than dialing 981 in any kind of mental health crisis, but particularly if there's concern for suicide, you can dial 988. And then there's also a crisis text line at 741741 that you can text with somebody. Um, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, thanks all for listening. I haven't looked at the Q&A, but I'm hoping there's some good questions and I'm happy to field the ones that I can. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Amy, for your wonderful presentation. I definitely want to dive into some of the attendee questions that we had uh, come through as you were presenting. So from C Candace McLeod, have you seen an impact on children's state of mental health due to the pandemic, especially uh, elementary aged? Um, yeah, I would say it's been really interesting because the pandemic has been so hard on some kids. And like I mentioned, I've seen an increase in um, in emergency room visits, and that's been borne out in the data as well. On some kids, it's actually been helpful. I've heard a lot of anecdotal reports of kids who say like, I, school was so stressful, I was being bullied, I didn't fit in, now I have this other option. Um, I really like online learning, I have free time, I'm self-motivated. So it's really upended education in a lot of ways, some of which are good, some of which are bad. I would say in general on balance, it has not been good for kids because that really just kind of threw them out of their routine and their systems. But my hope, and I'm kind of an eternal optimist this way, my hope is that it's made us really rethink the education system and what works for each kid and think about more models like hybrid learning, um, having more flexible schedules for kids and keeping an eye on kids who need it. Absolutely. 
Uh, from Caitlin Anderson, what are some lasting mental health impacts you are seeing or expecting from the pandemic, even as things open up, but the pandemic isn't over yet? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I always have things that I'm thinking I'm going to see, and they change all the time because I've been so wrong. Um, I do expect, again, that like things like work and school will be rethought and at first I thought, well, this will be great. Like nobody will have to commute and go into the office anymore. And the more that I work from home, the more I realize, like, I actually kind of need to go into the office sometimes. And so finding that balance of like, how much do we throw the baby out with the bathwater and how much do we find a really working hybrid of the various things that we had before. Um, but I do think that the long lasting impacts of a lot of the unemployment and the stress and the illness that went on with people that we're going to see impacts of that, especially in the children who struggled with, you know, there were some kids who had a MacBook in their own room and great Wi-Fi, and they could go home and just do their work. There were other kids who shared a room with three of their siblings. Their parents were still trying to work two service jobs that they were being exposed to coronavirus every day. Maybe their parents ended up hospitalized, lost their job, lost their housing. There were people who lived on the margins in terms of financial security and housing security, that those impacts are not gonna, they're not gonna be able to bounce back from those as easily. All righty. From Lawrence Durbin, regarding the homicide rates over time, is there a breakdown for non-binary and a breakdown of the gender based upon overall gender identity? How many of those are cis or non or versus trans identifying? That's a great question. I don't have the data for that. So I'll mention this also because someone had written something in the chat about the Hispanic designation. So the way that the data is broken down is how the CDC gathers it and this, the census data. So, you know, I think of Hispanic as not, that's not the term I usually use to describe, for example, Latina people living in um, California, but that's the census data. And so they don't collect data on people who identify. I mean, maybe they do, but it's not part of the data set in the whiskers of people who identify as trans, non-binary. You can choose male, female, or both. So we know that trans people from other work have very high rates of being victimized and of homicide, but there's not a way for me to factor that into that particular graph. Got it. From Claire Douglas, how do changes in non-U.S. rates of homicide compare to changes in U.S. rates of homicide in 2020? Oh, that's a good question. Um, our rates of homicide, and I have a slide about this somewhere, but we are American exceptionalism at its finest here. We are like off the charts higher than other countries. Um, again, because we have so many more guns, but I'm not sure that the change in the US was bigger, I suspect that it was. And I suspect that that change was largely driven by firearm purchasing, which wasn't something that we saw in other countries, but I can't say for sure. Good question though. Great question, Claire. I have my own questions as well, and I'm trying to run through everybody's on the on the attendee <laughs> list instead of being selfish. Uh, so from Luciano uh, Casillas, sorry if I said your name wrong, um, with the implementation of 988, is there any data that may show an increase in people asking for help? Yeah, good question. We don't know because it just launched like a week ago. Um, there may be data from when the suicide lifelines launched or the text line that was an increase in volume of people asking for help. And I, I think that's sort of the hope, right? Is that it's so simple and people will remember it rather than being like, is it 237 or 273? It's just 988. Um, so I really hope that folks will call. And, you know, one of the, the there's the simplifying the suicide lifeline into three numbers, but so that people can remember and call during a mental health crisis. But part of this also arose in concern to how police often respond to folks in mental health crisis, particularly people of color who have higher rates of um, being injured or killed by police during these kinds of crises. So that there was a non-police, and I don't want to say it's non-police because certainly police can become involved, but that there is an emergency crisis line to call that isn't directly to police dispatch. So that there's the possibility of a counselor, a therapist, a mental health person um, responding to you initially. And then in many places, and I know Sacramento has this where I am, 
you can have a team that goes out that's a mental health specific team. So it may be a social worker and a law enforcement officer in pair, but that law enforcement officer is somebody who's specifically trained in de-escalating mental health crises and working with folks with mental illness and that they not only have training in this, but an interest in that kind of work rather than just, you know, your standard police, police officer. Okay. And then for our final question from an anonymous attendee, bringing it back to this being a data and diversity event, which data sources slash white papers do you recommend us to look at to see conflating detriments of mental health problems? Sorry. Oh, determinants. Sorry. Sorry. Can you repeat that question? Which data sources oh, okay. slash white papers do you recommend? Um, for specifically for the sort of mental health problems versus mental illnesses, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because I feel like, um, people who work in psychiatry, mental health, and, you know, academics more focus on the mental illnesses, whereas the media and the, um, people who don't work in those fields as much will talk about mental health problems. And then there's some overlap in what they're talking about. I don't really have a great resource for you of, of that gap bridging of, of somebody who can kind of talk about both. Okay. I think we just have to be sort of aware that there is a spectrum of what folks are talking about and, um, and, and just kind of read it with a discerning eye. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Amy. I know there are a couple of other questions. So if you have some additional time, any questions that are in the, the Q&A, uh, would you mind just, just answering those for our attendees? But, but thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge and experience with mental health and providing some useful interventions for us all today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I'm happy I can stay on for about five more minutes and answer some of these if, um, if that's helpful. Perfect, thank you. Um, All right. Do you want to read them to me, Chantilly, or do you want me to? Oh, they were in the chat. Oh, in the chat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. So in the um, Q and A button. I see one about psychedelics and one about ketamine. So I'm going to roll those in together. Um, there's uh, so ketamine is FDA approved for certain types of treatment of depression under certain circumstances. And there's good evidence to show that particularly in the short term that it works quite well for relieving depression. Um, this is big news because antidepressants only work for some smaller subset of people who have depression and they take a long time, like a month or two. And oftentimes people don't have that long to wait. So um, we don't, we ketamine hasn't been around that long. It's not ubiquitous in terms of people having access to it, but it really does show a lot of promise in terms of um, what it could do. We just have to be concerned about the long-term effects, both good and bad. Um, there's also a lot of exciting, I think, research going on about um, MDMA, LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, a lot of things that, you know, hallucinogens that have been heavily stigmatized because they're, you know, recreational drugs, as was ketamine for a while, but really do show promise of working on the serotonin system and helping people with depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so I, I think those are kind of a wait and see sort of situation, but this is one of the few new exciting things that psychiatry has had on the horizon in terms of treating patients that don't get well with traditional therapies. One of the other ones is um, transcranial mag magnetic stimulation, which sounds like something out of a sci-fi book. And frankly, it's not entirely clear exactly how it works or what it does, but what is clear from the data is that it really works for people and it works quickly with minimal side effects. And so it's really exciting to see these new things come on the horizon. Um, let's see. Data on Asian ethnic groups and mental health. You know, I don't, and that's a good question. And that is notably absent from a lot of the data sets I use. And I'm not sure why they often, you know, cover white, black, and Hispanic and leave it there. Again, I'm kind of limited to what's out there. So I, I'm not quite sure. Um, this is a good question about in the public school setting, are we seeing a lack of, um, are we seeing impacts from face-to-face, -face, lack of face-to-face -face interactions? And this is one of those things that people who were very against the school shutdowns really used as leverage to say, like, we need to open schools. Kids are not learning to 
you know, read emotions, they're not learning to speak, they're not learning to interact properly and socialize. I don't think we've seen that borne out in the data. We have seen, you know, kids have lost, like high schoolers have lost some of their math skills, but um, I don't think it's impossible that we will see effects, particularly on like very young elementary and kindergarten age kids that we will see long-term effects of this, but we don't know yet. And I, I think it's, um, we haven't seen anything so egregious or so serious that it's coming out now. Um, I think that might have been the, the last one. Oh, there's one quick about social media. I'll answer this one as the last one. All right. Social media. I don't know that social media is creating mental illnesses. I would suspect not. It may be worsening people's mental health. And there's been a lot of studies about how people, particularly teenagers with social media, who have high levels of social media use, have higher levels of depression and anxiety. What we don't know, and there's been a lot of sort of moral panic and hysteria about this. What we don't know is whether or not social media is making them having higher levels of anxiety and depression, or if kids who have higher levels of anxiety and depression try to mitigate that by going online and scrolling through Instagram or getting on TikTok or whatever it is. So are they self-medicating with social media or is social media creating this? We don't know. And um, I, I think either way, social media is out there. I've got teenagers, I, uh, that, that horse has left the barn. And so what we really need to do is gather good data on this so that we can inform ourselves about like what the impact really is and then work on it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, thanks so uh, much for having me. Yeah, such an insightful presentation and really great questions from the audience. And thanks for taking the time to, to answer those questions. All righty. I'd like to transition things over and welcome our next speaker, Shazira Ahmad Zawawi. Shazira is a lawyer, a human rights advocate, and comic artist. She is currently working as a senior advisor on research and innovation for the Association for Prevention of Torture, a nonprofit organization based in Geneva, Switzerland. She had her comic published by various human rights organizations and bodies that includes International Commission of Jurists, Amnesty International, Child Rights Connect, and Asia Legal Resource Center. She visits about mental health, human rights issues, culture, Southeast, Southeast Asian folklores, and even her cat. Shazira will be walking through her journey of documenting and visualizing her mental health over the span of four days and how it landed her a biz of the day. Thank you for joining us today, Shazira. Take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Shantili, for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and evening. To, to all of you who are following this event from everywhere you are. I'm currently connected from Malaysia, so it's quite late here. And I just wanna say it's really an honor to be um, part of this event and super amazing to hear such insightful uh, presentation from Shola and Dr. Amy before this. And I also wanna thank, a massive thanks to Tableau community for inviting me to share my small story and for providing a space for us to discuss this very important topic. So as you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer by profession, um, but I'm also working on human rights issues. And so, yeah, so it's not, you know, it's, it's really about me juggling a lot of things at the same time as all of us do. And, as what been shared by Dr. Amy before, the pandemic to a certain extent affect us. And today, my story, I would like to share with you um, how I came up with this particular data visualization called my state of mind, which actually visualized four days of my most difficult week uh, last year. So before we get to it, maybe we can go to the next slide um, so we can have a look at the, so this is the, this is the particular uh, visualization. So actually I just embarked on my Tableau public journey last year, late in February. And this was my first visualization that I shared in conjunction with the World Mental Health Day with the broader audience on social media. And through this very personal views, 
I wanted to share with others my day-to-day -day struggle living with bipolar disorder. I specifically choose four days of my quite difficult week as I felt at that moment that was enough for me to tell my story. So there was a bit of self-reflection, um, self-internalization, trying to figure out what to share and who I'm sharing the V's with. So overall, it was not an easy decision to make. Throughout the four days in the V's, you can see how I go through my typical state of mind that ranges from being agitated, anxious, calm, depressed, elated, focused, frustrated, numb, and overwhelmed while doing my daily routines. And I know that I can see from the chat that, you know, there are some of you who also uh, share a similar experience and I feel you and I know where you're coming from. And so I intended for the V's to be as simple and raw as possible, because to me, the story itself was very personal and quite loaded. Next. So maybe we rewind a bit and start from the beginning. So I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder too when I was 29. And in the beginning, I have to say that due to lack of motivation, denial, shame, I was not regularly getting the treatment that I needed. But I'm happy to say that I'm currently going through my weekly therapy and treatment. But that doesn't mean that I escape the ups and downs. Um, so especially during the pandemic, this was quite a huge problem for me. Next, please. So I was always trying to figure out ways to cope with my struggle. And one of the way or system that I developed was by trying to track my mood swings. So I basically have this Excel, sh Excel sheet where I plot the day as it goes, um, how I'm doing mentally, the activities or routines that I was you know, undertaking and where it takes place. And this particular uh, recording or documentation of data grow and grow and grow. And before I knew it, I have like a journal of my mood swings or what I call it as mood sheets. While it sounds easy, I have to say that I don't really do it all the time because sometimes, you know, I don't have the motivation to record anything. Sometimes I'm more excited or driven to do it. And so the mood journal or sheets are really a work in progress, just like me, but it's okay because to me, it's a, it's a self-recognition of, of the struggle I'm going through and that it was my effort to sort of um, track and anticipate how I am dealing with, with this on a daily basis. Next, please. So deep down, even though I have such a documentation, I still find it very difficult to communicate to others my condition. I'm also too proud to admit that uh, I'm struggling with my mental health. As compared to, for instance, having an explicit wound or, a, or an overt injury, you know, at the outside, I look healthy, I look happy, I can joke around. So there's certainly a contradiction there that sometimes confuse people and it's very difficult for me to explain myself. So because of that, as an artist, as an illustrator, I started to think of creative ways to channel all these frustrations, um, all these stories that I want to share with others about my condition. Next, please. So when I discovered data visualization in the beginning, I was a bit skeptical about whether or not this is a good platform for me to tell my story. Because at the same time, I was also a bit um, hesitant and wondering whether by doing this, the data that I share through my visualizations, we lost the human dimension behind it. And so when I created State of Mind, it is also like a personal challenge for me to breach my existing skill as 
an artist, as an illustrator, with my newfound love in data visualization. And though, you know, it all started with experiments because while I have this data set, you know, I started by painting them, I started by um, drawing them as comics. But when I start developing the data visualization, it was quite an empowering um, experience because I'm actually putting my data out there to share about my struggles with everyone. And these are the facts of life that I have about my situation. And so, you know, it's sort of a combination of both something that I'm quite fearful of doing, quite nervous about the impact of doing that. But at the same time, I feel that, you know, I wanted to do this um, to address and to share my story with others in a different way and in a more relatable and accessible way as well. Next. So there are a couple of things I learned about myself when I was visualizing and collecting the data. The first thing that I realized was that by having this tracking with the Excel sheet, it actually introduced a healthy routine into my life as it helped me track how I'm doing. It helped me to recognize my difficulties. Um, it's not always perfect, but again, the documentation, the recording doesn't have to be perfect. It's my own personal recording. So as I track my days, better and better, it also helped increase my own self-awareness. I could then, to a certain extent, anticipate better how, how well or how bad I was doing and find out ways either to slow down myself, take a break, or even meditate. Gathering my data and, visualization and visualizing them also helped give visibility to the issue through two ways. At my level, it helped me reconcile with a part of myself that I wanted to suppress so much because of shame and frustration and denial. Secondly, it empowered me to feel better about being who I am publicly. Having said that, this does not mean that the process of sharing my views publicly was easy. I don't really know how people will react to it, nor am I ready for the follow-up responses. So there was a lot of consultations there was a lot of discussions and of course, encouragement from the data fam community who I spoke to in personally, who sort of gave me a lot of encouragement and motivation uh, throughout the journey. So I just wanna thank them for being there um, to hear my stories and also to provide feedback whenever I need them. And you know who you are. Next, please. The community's response to the VIS was actually overwhelmingly positive and it was really touching. Um, so here I just want to sort of show you some of the responses I received. Overall, I received a lot of love um, and support when I um, share the visualization on social media. I think it was also very empowering and, and, and um, you know, helped me build this solidarity with other authors and other people out there who also share similar experience or also going through their own struggles as they approach me and talk to me about their experience. And I see that this visualization also helped to be an entry point for people with similar stories to connect and maybe to help support one another. There are also uh, people in the community who are curious, and I appreciate that as well, asking me, how do I track? How do I keep on doing this? Why do I choose you know, this platform? Or why do I choose this design? And I appreciate those questions as well, because this is also another way to open up these conversations, which might be a bit difficult before. And now you, know, you, you really get to go into it by using this data visualization um, as a canvas or as a starting point. And of course, there's also a lot of care and love from, from some of you. So there are really people who come to me and ask me <laughs> sincerely, are you okay? Are you doing well? And to me, you know, being having people checking in with me like that is also amazing. 
um, and totally unexpected. So these are some of the responses I get to the Vs. And to be honest, I was expecting the worst <laughs> at the beginning of it. So when, when the Vs were selected as the Vs of the day in conjunction with the World Mental Health Day, I was, I was, I don't know how to describe my feelings because it was both, you know, um, surprised, but also um, in a way, a kind of validation um, that stories like this deserve a space in the community, that we need to have this conversation more and more in the data community. And, and this is, as you can see, an emerging trend. There are more authors, great storytellers in the community telling their personal stories. And to me, the personal is always powerful, even for a data visualization. Next. How can we create the right environment for sharing and discussion? I have to admit, I'm not an expert on this at all, but perhaps I can share some of my small experience from sharing that visualization. And to me, those are really positive experience that perhaps could help us you know, build further or discuss further the right kind of environment to share difficult stories like this. Next, please. So the first one I think is, it's important to create a safe and welcoming space for others to share stories about their mental health, about their struggle, because it takes a lot of courage and strength to show or share your vulnerability with others. So I really encourage the community to welcome such story and recognize the struggle that the authors may have to visualize their personal data. A safe space for me is also a space where I will be able to tell my stories without fear of judgment, harassment, stigmatization, and intimidation. Well, so far, none of that happened. Everything is good. But then I always believe that it's always good to nurture um, an environment that are sensitive to the risks and potentials that this could happen. Next, please. At the same time, while I welcome or encourage us to create that space, sharing such difficult story can be quite challenging too. And so I feel there is a need to also give some space to the artists who share these stories. While we may have so, so many questions to ask or views to share, I think it will be also great to respect a bit the author's experience and privacy and consider his or her well being in how you treat, use, or share the data stories or engage the person. I personally would love to engage and have a chat about the data visualization I did, which is the state of mind. But I would sometimes give myself some space or see if I'm ready to delve more into the subject with others. I admit that this can be a very tricky thing to achieve in terms of getting the right balance of this. Next, please. And this is also more of a reminder to myself and others that as Dr. Amy said, experience of people from mental health or mental illness is very individual and personal. So it's, it's also good to respect and perceive every experience shared as different and try to see and contextualize it to the author situation. While there could be a common name to the mental illness or issue we're facing, everyone has a different level of coping, stresses, triggers, and struggle. So it's also good to remind ourselves of the human voice behind each data visualized. And last but not least, sometimes these data stories shared could be different or something that you are not familiar with. And that's okay. You can always take the time to approach the authors, but handle such discussion with care and empathy. Some of us could be nervous. I am a very nervous person, to be honest, to, to be talking here today. Um, I hope I'm doing well, <laughs> or unsure how to explain our conditions or situation, or some could even be more articulate than others. I'd say take each story share as an opportunity to learn more about the issue and to connect and build further understanding 
and show of support for authors and for others who share their difficult stories. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story. Uh, I definitely echo with the regards to some of the comments that were coming through in the chat where they were saying about your bravery um, and sharing your story. It definitely resonates with, I'm sure it's a ton of members within the audience. So we appreciate that and thank you so much. All right. So we only have a, a few minutes left for our event, but I do wanna end by saying thank you to you all for attending today's event. And thanks again, Shola, Dr. Barnhorst, and Shazira for sharing your time, your insights, and your knowledge. We hope you learned about ways data and analytics can be used to create a more inclusive, diverse, and equitable future for all. And with that, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day or your evening, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.